Hey guys, it's Goosebumps Completionist, and today I'm bringing you a Goosebumps Talk type of video. And if you clicked on the video, you're obviously here to hear about 10 urban legends centered around the original Goosebumps TV show. Some of these I have heard as far back as 1999, talking with kids at my babysitter's house, on the bus, on the playgrounds, in school cafeterias, etc. Some of these I've grown over time to know within talking with people in the community as they brought these urban legends to light for me to talk about them in this video. Now there are some other urban legends I'm sure of out there that I'm not covering in this video and if you know of any please comment in the comment section after you hear the ones I'm bringing up just to point out the ones I may have missed. I do plan on making this some type of sequel series where I could be doing a follow-up to even more urban legends from the TV series and as well I will be doing a book series urban legend series where I'll be covering the encompassing book series in Goosebumps and the common urban legends heard around those. So today in this video I wore my slappy shirt as a fitting uh, start to kick off the first two urban legends. Normally these two are kind of intertwined kind of lumped together that's why I wanted to talk about these first. And these two are definitely the most common ones I hear out in the Goosebumps community. And I've heard these myself since I was about six or seven years old. So I can give some validity to this. All right, so the first urban legend we're going to be talking about is the Night of the Living Dummy 1 episode. Aired nationally in the U.S. only once, but never re-aired again due to it being too terrifying for Fox Kids Network and ultimately was pulled from further syndication and deemed ineligible for home media release of any kind. This urban legend is false. It's been recently revealed in August 2020 that the Night of the Living Dummy 1 episode was deemed not feasible in possibility for the production team of the original series and was never even made. Now my initial reaction to this, <laughs> I was surprised but then I wasn't at the same time. Why I'm not surprised is because of the plot of Night of the Living Dummy 1. It gets kind of dark, kind of animal abuse-ish. Um, if you read the book, you understand why. But at the same time, I understand it for production reasons. There would be destroying props involved. There would be darker elements involved. And I don't know if this would have worked in Season 1, where I'm assuming this episode would have aired. I don't know if they would have treaded the waters with this uh, story. Now, I can see some sides of the argument. They could have tweaked the plot like they did some episodes and made it work. That's completely fair. But I don't know the logistics behind the budget and all that. So until more information comes out about this, maybe there could be more mostly true elements to this that it could have been made. But as far as it being made and only airing once, that's completely false. The second urban legend. Now this one, <clears throat> like I said, kind of goes hand in hand with the first one. I hear this commonly used as well. Urban legend number two. The slappy dummy used throughout the first three seasons was initially meant to be Mr. Wood, the main antagonist from Night of the Living Dummy 1, the book, but was changed to slappy after Night of the Living Dummy 1 was scrapped to save money on making another dummy prop, aka for budgetary reasons. This urban legend is unconfirmed. There seems to be a bit of talk in the community that the look of Slappy in the show looks more like Mr. Wood, given the description in the book, Night of the Living Dummy Number 1. So the legend goes, they originally made the Mr. Wood dummy prop before they knew if they were making Night of the Living Dummy 1 the episode. And after the idea of adapting the story was scrapped, they repurposed the Mr. Wood dummy prop to be Slappy. I can see this one being true. The problem is there's never been evidence corroborating this on the internet or through interviews. Yes, the description of Mr. Wood with, you know, the green eyes and the orange hair does match the Slappy that we see in the show. And I can see maybe why they wouldn't want to do two dummies to save money. They've already spent a lot of money on this realistic looking prop dummy. Why waste the money if they're not going to use Mr. Wood to begin with? I can see that side of the coin. So 
this urban legend, I'm actually inclined to believe in some ways, but I'm not going to say I 100% will push it as fact. I'm just going to say this one is unconfirmed, which I think that's where it is currently until we get more information. Now, moving on to urban legend number three, <clears throat> this one I have heard since I was probably five years old back in 1999. And I remember somebody pointing this out to me, and it blew my mind when I originally heard it. And I for completely forgot about it until years later. I was probably in my early 20s, watching this show with a couple of my friends. And even one of my other friends, who I didn't even go to elementary school with, knew about this legend. So I think this one, people probably used to spread <laughs> a lot, you know, in the rumor mills back in the day. I don't know if it's well known today. But I'm just going to tell you what I know about it. So urban legend number three. The Haunted Mask 1 and 2 were actually Shock Street Studios movies. This one's unconfirmed. In the season three episode, A Shocker on Shock Street, the main characters are seen touring the Shock Street movie studio. And on the shelves sit the masks from the Haunted Mask episodes, sparking theories that they were hinted to be Shock Street Studios movies because of the cameo as it's further corroborated in the episode Werewolf Skin, where the main character was reading a horror magazine and saw the masks inside of it in a picture. Now this one is obviously dealing with the TV universe lore. Are the episodes somewhat linked? That's the idea. Now from a practical point of view, I'm looking at it, they were just using uh, reused props to avoid having to spend money on brand new props. But on the other side of it, it could be a nod to not only The Haunted Mask 1 and 2 being Shock Street movies, but there were also other reuse props in this episode as well. Even one prop that we don't see until Deep Trouble the next season after. So, in my opinion, this could be plausible. Maybe, just maybe, some episodes are linked to Shock Street Studios. Even the production of Cry the Cat which was in season four. So this all kind of encompasses a whole big rabbit hole dealing with this uh, TV lore thing. But I think this one's plausible, so I'll say it's unconfirmed. Until more evidence comes out, like I said, with these unconfirmed ones, that's where I'm going to leave it. All right, so let's go to Werewolf Skin, since I just brought up Werewolf Skin, uh, having its... You know, continuing the lore, the possibility that The Haunted Mask 1 and 2 are Shock Street movies, Werewolf Skin also has an urban legend associated with it. So urban legend number four. The episode Werewolf Skin was the catalyst for head show writers Dan Angel and Billy Brown leaving the show after season three. This one's true. This one's surprisingly true. Dan Angel and Billy Brown were head writers for the show and had a clear vision for the episode Werewolf Skin which after submission was swiftly rejected by Fox, which ultimately upset the duo as they resigned from the show. Ron Oliver was tasked to the Werewolf Skin script after, however, Dan Angel and Billy Brown are still credited for the episode's writing in both end credits for the two-parter. So what happened was <clears throat> Dan Angel and Billy Brown wrote an original script for Werewolf Skin and what they wanted to see adapted. To my knowledge, I don't know the whole details behind this. There was something said on the lines of this was going to be their most adventurous story they've ever done. And Fox immediately turned it down. They thought it wasn't going to work for the rating they had. Back in the day, it was TVY7. This one was supposed to push the envelope and really set the mark for what Ultimate Goosebumps was supposed to be. And when they thought that the studio wasn't behind their vision, they felt like they weren't being appreciated, so they left the show. Ironically, though... This is true. If you check the end credits for Werewolf Skin Part 1 and Part 2, uh, Dan Angel and Billy Brown are still credited with writing the script for that episode. So whether that script had parts of it that were adapted into the new script Ron Oliver was in charge of, I can't tell you the full details. But what I can tell you, it's basically confirmed and true that Dan Angel and Billy Brown left the show because of a falling out due to Werewolf Skin. So if you've ever heard that urban legend, that one surprisingly is true. All right, keeping it with Dan Angel and Billy Brown, we got urban legend number five. 
Chilogy was adapted from a rejected book idea by R.L. Stein. This one's false. Chilogy was an original three-part story co-written and developed by Dan Angel and Billy Brown, who were head writers at the time. Chilogy aired in season three. R.L. Stein had no direct involvement in the writing or developing of those episodes. So this is true. R.L. Stein did not have any involvement in Chilogy Part 1, 2, or 3. And I believe more Monster Blood. But this one I hear get talked about a lot because people associate Chilogy with Beetlejuice. And it seems that Stein, over the course of Goosebumps, takes inspiration from existing pop culture references. This one would have been a shoe-in book idea that Stein had. But, I don't mean to burst people's bubble, bubbles, but Dan Angel and Billy Brown concocted this whole story from scratch. They did it all themselves. Arl Stein had nothing to do with Chilogy. Just a namesake on the credits of the episode. So that's Urban Legend number 5. Now, Urban Legend number 6, this one... Is kind of a doozy <laughs> but you'll see why urban legend number six deep trouble was mistitled and was meant to be titled deep trouble 2 referring to the episode this one's mostly true but it's actually unconfirmed the series finale was the two-part episode deep trouble implying that it was based on the 19th book of the same name in in the original book series but its plot is actually based on the plot of deep trouble 2 which is book number 58 in the original book series, leading people to believe there was a mistake involved with the title given. The fact the first Night of the Living Dummy episode was Night of the Living Dummy 2, not starting on the first book in that series, supports this. I, I get the argument, you know, if Night of the Living Dummy, the episode franchise, you know, we got Night of the Living Dummy 2, 3, and Bride, if those started on the second book, it would make sense if they couldn't do Deep Trouble 1, why wouldn't they just title it Deep Trouble 2? But at the same time, it's never been confirmed if it was a mistake or not. Uh, and this urban legend I've heard many times is that people always adamantly say, and even I have you know, believed this myself, and I still kind of do, I like to reference that episode as Deep Trouble 2, because it's the same plot as the 58th book, Deep Trouble 2. So this one I definitely think has mostly true elements but as of now, it's still unconfirmed. Maybe uh, a single tweet can definitely wrap up the loose ends and confirm it once and for all. So, yeah. Urban Legend number seven. Now, this one's kind of a bittersweet one. I've heard this one a couple of times in the rumor mills and just trying to give some light on this urban legend. So, Urban Legend number seven. An actress died while filming the episode Teacher's Pet. This one's mostly true, but it's actually false. Actress Michelle Reese, who played the main female protagonist in the episode, died at the age of 16 in December of 1997 from meningitis, a few months after filming wrapped up for the episode, and a few months before the episode actually aired. The credits at the end of the episode de dedicate the episode to her memory, potentially originating this urban legend. I get it, you know, the context at the end credits of the episode dedicating the episode to her memory some people might associate it with maybe she died during filming but in actuality she wrapped up filming and then she passed away from meningitis before the episode aired and then after she passed away they decided to dedicate it to her memory in the editing room before they aired it so this one is a pretty easy one to clear up but not a, not a lot of people know the actual circumstances involved so yeah, this one's mostly true, but it's actually false. So if you ever hear that she died while filming Teacher's Pet, that's false. Okay? Now, this one I know almost every diehard fan of the TV show knows. This one went probably from a theory that a fan started to a full-blown rumor to a full-blown urban legend. This one has been talked about for many, many, many years. And it deals with the lore of the TV show. This is another one of those uh, TV lores, kind of like the Haunted Mask 1 and 2 being Shock Street movies. This one's right up there with it. And this one's more commonly known. So, Urban Legend number 8. In the episode The Werewolf of Fever Swamp, 
The main character hallucinated the werewolf in the swamp after being stricken with the fever the swamp allegedly gives its residents. This one's actually unconfirmed. The ending of the episode and the book are vastly different, as in the book, Grady and his dog Vandal are said to roam the swamp during the nights of a full moon after Grady is bitten by a werewolf. And in the episode, it is shown in the final scenes, Grady's parents on looking Grady sleeping in the bed, worrying about him, and then cuts to him waking in a pool of sweat, implying a fever, potentially, to then walking outside and howling at the moon, leaning some to believe the fever of Fever Swamp had altered Grady's brain chemistry. This one, <laughs> I like the direction of this urban legend. I like that the ending of the episode has a dual meaning. On one side of the spectrum, you still believe that Grady was bitten by the werewolf, and his parents are worried about him because he's been acting up ever since the bite, and he's been disappearing at all hours of the night, and he's a werewolf. Then on the other side of the coin, it's a complete fabrication in Brady's mind as he fell asleep in a fever dream because he caught the fever of Fever Swamp. And imagine the entire events that took place in the episode. And because the fever has altered his brain chemistry, he now believes he's a werewolf. And that's the urban legend. This one is plausible. I actually do think that the writers of the show could have definitely redirected the plot at the end uh, from the book as the book it's clearly stated he is a werewolf but in the episode it's so ambiguous there's two interpretations so this one i think it has some plausibility to it but as of now it's unconfirmed really good urban legend all right <clears throat> urban legend number nine this one's a recent one it was brought to my attention by a couple people actually and when i looked into this myself i was blown away by this and just have to share it with you Okay, so Urban Legend number 9. Strain Peas, which was adapted in Season 3 from the first Tales to Give You Goosebumps book, had its plot stolen by writers working on the show Creeped Out. This one's unconfirmed. In Season 2 of the worldwide distributed show that can be found on Netflix called Creeped Out, the seventh episode titled Only Child, released in 2019, or 2020, whatever year it is, bears a striking resemblance and plot to the Tales of Gibby Goosebumps short story adapted to TV back in 1997, a full 20 plus years before. It seems the stories flow almost identically, except one difference of the baby being switched at the hospital in Strain Peas, as in Only Child, the baby is truly the protagonist's sibling. Now, I followed up on this theory. I watched Strain Peas, which, you know, it's not my favorite episode, but I watched it to compare. It to only child i'm gonna be honest there is a lot of similarities going on there now this one could be chalked up to coincidence this one could be more of like an inspiration uh, a reimagining but the pace of the episodes match almost identically the reveal is almost slightly the same minus like one plot difference but this one i think has some tangibility to it I would say it's more on the unconfirmed side, more than plausible, it's just strictly unconfirmed. But until more evidence comes out about it, that's where I'm going to leave it, unconfirmed. And then the last urban legend. Now this one's another popular one I have heard, at least since the mid-2000s. And I think you guys know where I'm going with this one. Kind of dealing with the same subject matter as urban legend number 9. And the final urban legend I'll be talking about in this video is urban legend number 10. Click which was adapted in Season 3 from the first book of Tales to Give You Goosebumps short stories, had its plot stolen by Adam Sandler after watching the episode, and Sandler used the plot to make the hit 2006 film Click of the same name. This one's still unconfirmed after 15 plus years. There's eerie similarities from the short story published in 1995 and the episode from 1997 to the hit movie in 2006 from the title of the respective works all the way down to how the remote functions side effects of using the remote and even a similar consequence for misusing the remote but it's never been 100 percent proven sandler stole the idea from goosebumps i've heard this one and like i said since the mid-2000s a lot of people seem to back this idea the idea of a universal remote having consequences sending you to a parallel dimension that can pause time, fast forward events, 
you can color change on the remote. Uh, you can, you know, it's so many similarities to the plot of the movie and the Goosebumps story that I can kind of see this being plausible. This is not the first time Sandler's been accused of plot robbing. Uh, there's another one that's been thrown around with the movie Pixels, but I don't know the details about it. I just know that Pixels has been thrown around out there as well. So this one, I, you know, I want to say it's plausible, but I'm going to leave it unconfirmed for now. It's a really good urban legend. People like to talk about it. It's definitely thought-provoking, but I guess it's down to who you trust and who you believe at the end of the day. So yeah, those were 10 urban legends centered around the original Goosebumps TV series. Like I said, I do plan on doing a sequel video to this at some point, and I do plan on doing the next video mainly to be about um, urban legends sitting around the Goosebumps book series in general. When I'll get to that is when I get together all the urban legends. But I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you guys know any other urban legends I did not cover in this video, please leave them in the comments down below. If you guys have any thoughts or perspective about the urban legends that I mentioned in this video, also leave a comment in the comment section down below. I want to hear your thoughts, and I'll see you next time.